Uh, thank you, everyone, and uh, good afternoon. Good to be here. Um, great to be here to celebrate this centenary of Angus Australia. And it's really timely for this presentation because it's actually 10 years of the side benchmarking program as well, and I'll explain a bit more about what this program's about. Um, but it's good to see those two things lining up. And um, I'm sure 100 years ago, the founders of Angus Australia didn't have any concept of an, uh, a side benchmarking type scheme. Um, but it's definitely becoming a very important part of our business at Angus Australia, as we'll explain today. Um, when I sat down to this presentation, I thought, what actually happened 10 years ago? I know 10 years ago I was single, had no kids, it's a very different life for me, um, had no grey hair or a beard. Um, got, got a mortgage now, yeah, all those things. Um, then I thought, let's, let's investigate to see what happened 10 years ago. So what happened 10 years ago? Um, what I thought was interesting is that's when the iPad was, Apple iPad was introduced, was the first one on the sale, which I thought was interesting. Seems like it's been around for hundreds of years, but it was actually 10 years ago it came onto the market. Um, the iPhone had been around a little while, but not the iPad. Um, in regards to sport, I'm a sports nut. Um, Sachin Tendulkar scored the first one day 200 runs against South Africa. So that was a bit of a milestone achievement. Probably they have in every, every game now, nearly. Uh, Jessica Watson sailed around the world solo as a 16-year-old. Quite amazing achievement. Don't think it's been repeated, has it? Um, in the football, St George and Collingwood won the uh, premierships. That's pretty bad for me, but um, I'm sure it excites someone. Um, and for the young people in the audience, it's also when they discovered Justin Bieber. Um, ten years ago, he came into the market. Look at him now. Anyway, that's what happened 10 years ago, but also what happened 10 years ago is the side benchmarking program started. Uh, so it's been functioning for 10 years. So what I'm going to cover in this presentation, we've got about 20 minutes. Um, we'll talk about, just introduce you to the side benchmarking program if you're not familiar with it. Um, obviously it's a good opportunity to provide some good acknowledgements and there's lots of people involved in this program, so uh, we'll, we'll do that. Um, focusing on what some of the main outcomes are. Um, there's lots of outcomes, so I don't have all the time, all the time today to, to go through all those, but I'll, I'll pick out the main ones that I think. And then a very brief bit on what the future holds in regards to this program. Um, the ASBP started and had three main objectives when it was put together. Primarily, this is probably the main objective when it first started, was to provide project test data on modern Australian Angus bulls, especially for hard measure traits like feed efficiency, carcass quality, uh, heft fertility, immune competence, and things like that. Um, second point was to assemble data for the validation and the calibration and refinement of breed planning and genetic evaluation system. And the third point, which is probably the, at the time when I first started, was probably the, the, the number three of the three, or sort of the third priority, was to build a reference population of genotypes and phenotypes for genetic evaluation and R&D, but that's probably become the most important one in today's climate, We're building what we call that reference population. And I'll talk about that and mention that a number of times today. Um, in regards to the process, how it works, sires that go into the program are nominated by our members. Um, then we have a bit of a process to go through and select those sires for obviously their performance, their diversity, those sorts of things. Um, over the nine years, so we've done nine joining so far, um, there's 321 sires that have come into the program um, from cohorts one to nine, averaging about 36 per cohort. Some cohorts are around mid, mid 40s, some are down around 20 depending on the year, um, but that's where we, where we sit. And each of those bulls are joined by a fixed time AI one round to 50 to 60 females per cohort to produce about 25 to 30 progeny, obviously half males and half females, recorded for lots of data. So that's the, the male side. In regards to the progeny, they're breeding our cooperator herds, so the cooperator herds are very important. We need those commercial cow herds to do this, and they're primarily in commercial cow herds. There's a couple of research herds involved too, but primarily commercial Angus cow herds. The steer progeny are obviously coming out of those cow herds, measured all the way through from birth to weaning to feedlot intake. They then go to Tlingler Feedlot, uh, University of New England for feed intake testing through our grow safe devices for around 100 days. They then go in a long fed um, program of another 100 to 170 odd days. Uh, primarily they go through the Rangers Valley system and they've been great collaborators. Uh, there's a few later mobs, more recent mobs that have gone to Kiwi as well, but primarily long fed. Um, they then go and are uh, sorted at John Day Abattoir and they're a great collaborator allows us to go in and measure lots of stuff, um, even though we can be disruptive at times. Um, it's a great facility to work in and we collect meat samples and they go to the, the meat science lab. Um, there is an exception to that. Some cattle we, we are now short feeding for 100 days to do our retail beef field work. So um, 
basically, um, for example, this year, cohort seven will uh, will fully bone out one side of 350 steers in this program to get our retail beef field data, uh, which is pretty important for the program. Um, heavy progeny, we can't forget about those. Um, we're again bred on farm, recorded all the way from birth through to um, when they're joined as yearlings. Um, and then we measure their uh, days to calving to their first, first calving, basically. So we get a little snapshot of reproduction. Um, and, those, and those have to stay on farm at our crop raters' op, uh, properties. So that's how the, how the cattle flow through the program. Um, this is just a Gantt chart of where we're up to with the program. Um, started back in 2010, so I've got, a, I've got a, uh, the more recent years here now. 2018, as you can see across the top, the 2023. So we're currently funded to go to uh, cohort 11, okay? So um, cohort 11 will finish up about 2023. So I've got a little bit of job security, hopefully, that that's nice. Um, however, it just shows you how long-term project it is. By the time you join, animals and then see the steers coming out the other end of a long fed program, we're talking three and three and a half years. So, you know, it's a long time process, you've got to be really committed to it and that's one thing that Angus is, committed to these sorts of programs. Um, so, the red, the red line going down the page is basically where we're sitting at the moment. So, you can see we've completed cohorts one to six primarily and the active ones are seven, eight and nine, the ten and eleven are yet to be joined. Okay, so that's where we're, where we're sitting and where the program's at. The target across those eleven cohorts is to protein test over 400 bulls um, and collect data on 400 bulls and put them in a reference population based on around 5,500 steers and 5,500 heifer progeny. And we're on track to do that, so that's, that's good. Um, collaborators, and this is a very much a big thank you in the acknowledgement section. Um, this project couldn't happen, particularly at this scale, without all these collaborators. Um, Lean Lobster Australia are a very important collaborator. They provide co-funding and have done since the start of this program. So we match, get matching funding dollar for dollar with, uh, through the MLA donor company scheme, if you're aware of that. Um, we also have really good commercial um, partners in this program too. I've already mentioned Rangers Valley Feedlot, Kerwee Feedlot, uh, Vet Quinole, the Vet Quinole guys here, I saw them over there. Um, they provide uh, advice and products for our fixed time AI programs. Um, genotyping companies are important as well because we genotype all these cattle. Um, Alpha to help out with our net feeding take testing. That's the Australian Lot Feeders Association. Um, Cooperator cow herds. Now I can't understate these guys enough. Um, we've got a few in the audience. I see Steve Chase is here. Put your hand up, Steve. Hugh, Hugh was uh, a cooperator cow herd too. I don't know if uh, Richard Puddicum is here as well. Uh, but cow herds are very important. Without cows, this project wouldn't work. And without cow herds that are committed to, to doing what we asked them to do, it wouldn't happen as well. So uh, it's really appreciated to have those. Um, bull owners, without bulls being nominated, we couldn't make these programs. How many in the audience have actually had bulls that you've read have gone into the program? Could you put your hand up? Yep, so a lot of people have, which is great. Um, so I'm glad, I'm glad that's the case. Um, keep those nominations coming though. Um, other groups like University of New England, um, New South Wales DPI and CSIRO through collaboration, re collaborative research R&D are also very important partners. So again, I can't acknowledge these groups enough. We've also got a little, uh, few little pictures here of people that have been involved. Um, a few people I'll point out. Um, Nick Butcher, are you here, Nick? Uh, Nick's our project officer. Oh, Nick's, actually, I shouldn't think. Nick, he's not listening to my presentation. <laughs> he's gone somewhere else. Um, uh, Nick's our project officer and does a lot of the groundwork. Um, without, without him at this point in time, we couldn't make this project function. He does lots of the organising. Um, we've also got guys, and is Bob Dent in the audience? I think I've seen you, Bob. Um, got to acknowledge Bob because he basically um, was involved from the start of the program and he still provides lots of great advice to, to myself and Nick um, along the way. So thanks for your time, Bob, but lots of people involved. I also thought I'd put a picture up of Andrew Byrne to show you he does get out in the field once a year, right? So he does, does occasionally do a little bit of work. Even though I think he did that one key mate and then he went home, but we'll, we'll see. <laughs> Okay, so what did we achieve? Um, what we've achieved. So I want to get, go now and talk about the building of this reference population. Um, it's really our major objective these days, um, building a reference population of modern Angus cattle. Why is it important? Is because it enables Angus breed to take full advantage of genomic technologies. So there's no doubt genomic technologies is here, to, here with us in regards to breeding and it'll, they'll keep developing the tools. So we can only do that effectively as a group of breeders if we have a good reference population. Cattle that are well recorded for their, they've got a gen genomic profile, but they've also got the hard to measure traits, commercially relevant traits recorded. So that's the importance of these, this program. 
So for a reference population to be useful though, it really must be representative of the population from which it's selecting. So I suppose look at the extreme, if there was a Brahmin reference population of cattle and Angus breeds were trying to use that in selection, it probably wouldn't work very well. So that's why it's important we have our own reference population. We also need to be confident that the one we're developing is also representative of the industry and the industry genetics. So let's have a look at that in a bit more detail. Um, can we be confident that's been happening? Um, we did this on a few levels, and you may have seen some, some material we've put out some time ago on this, but it's, it's really reiterating that. First of all, we've got lots of animals, so by birth year and by cohort, we've got lots of size, 321, 9,500 odd progeny. Um, they're recorded from birth through the slaughter, as we've talked about, both steers and heifers from repro to reproduction. Most importantly, they're all being genotyped. So um, the SNP profiles, the number of gene markers on those profiles range from 8,000 SNPs in the early days, but nowadays you're getting you know, 40, 50,000 SNPs, depending on which product you use. Um, so they're all being genotyped, the size and their progeny. Uh, when I looked at those 321 size, just to get a bit of a feel for it, um, from cohorts one to nine, I sort of thought, how many, how many progeny are actually registered by these size, not just within ASBP, but across all registered herds. And across those 321 size, they've actually got nearly 91,000 progeny registered with Angus Australia. That's a good thing. If that was a low number, you would be a bit, bit concerned, but it's actually a, a high number. Um, so that's nice. Um, and that's across 808 member herds as well. So it's not just, again, two or three herds, it's across a lot of membership herds. And that's probably not a surprise, because you know, you know the bulls that have gone to the program, artificial, artificial breeding AI, a lot of you use AI, so it spreads across that way. Um, I also had a look at that in regards to how many had 100 more progeny registered with the Angus Australia members, and there was 171 of those size with that, so um, that's interesting. You have to also understand that some of our later cohorts, eight, nine, for example, are still young bulls that are still breeding themselves, so over time, you know, you expect them to get more progeny registered as well. Um, so that's how it sort of flows through. So that was a good little snapshot. Um, I just sort of list the top 25 size by progeny that have gone into the ASPP and how many progeny they have registered with Angus Australia members. So you look, look at bulls, you know them all. Adrosan Equator, Bartel, Edmund, Prophet, Black Pearl, Evident, et cetera, et cetera. So they're all bulls, a lot of them probably have been represented in your herd and therefore link the two programs, the reference population with the membership herds, which is nice. Um, geographically, not this is really probably says too much about relationship, but I thought it good to look out how, how the bulls have been spread and where they've come from. And nicely, we've uh, got bulls from right across Australia there, um, you know, from some southern Queensland to New South Wales, Victoria, Tasmania, South Australia, and, and Western Australia as well. We'd like to have more areas more represented, but in the end, you know, that's what we've got. Um, and we've also got bulls coming through from other countries. We've got lots of New Zealand representation there, important because we run a trans-Tasman evaluation. We merge our data sets. Um, but we've got US and we've got more US influence coming in and uh, UK in the early days, but we've sort of moved away from that a little bit. Okay, um, this is a nice little video. and That's all sort of anecdotal stuff I just talked about. This is more scientific. <laughs> um, so basically we said, okay, can we now use the DNA recorded on all those animals? So the animals that have DNA recorded with Angus Australia and the size that have gone in the program to see are they, are they representative when we look at a relationship on a genomic level. So this, this little, uh, I'll just play it again for you. This is a representation of the um, relationship between animals. So each of those dots represent an animal that's got a genomic profile. And it's using a thing called principal component analysis, which I won't go into in a lot of detail, but each of the black dots is just a genotyped animal in the Angus, refer in the, in the Angus breed. Um, the coloured dots, including the big coloured dots, um, the red ones and the big coloured dots, are all ASPP size. So what we're seeing there is we're seeing a nice spread across the relationship of the animals, okay? So we're seeing, we're not seeing all the ASBC, um, ASPP size clustered at one end of the, of the, of the population. We're not seeing a nice spread across. Um, this was done a little bit of time ago, and this was done by um, Agbu, Vincent Borner from Agbu. Um, so we need to update this to more relevant, but... It's going to tell us something similar, I think. We're, through our processes, we are getting a nice spread across the, the, um, the population of Angus when we look at it at a, on a genomic level. Um, we'll talk a bit more about that later on if, uh, if you're interested. Okay. okay, so we're comfortable now that the reference population is um, related to the general Angus population, so that's, that's nice. 
Um, and this is now some stats about how big our reference population is. And this, and this is stats that came out of our mid-May, so very recent mid-May 2019 brief plan evaluation. So this is a count of animals that have gone into the evaluation with a genotype and the listed phenotype. So for example, if you look at that first column, total animals, we've got about 53,000 animals all up the, um, that have gone into our brief plan evaluation for single step evaluation. Um, the black is what we call industry animals, so they're from your herds, they're, they're members' herds that have been measured for genotypes. The red is the ASBP animals. So if you look at all animals, about 18%, uh, about 18%, um, about 10,000, which is about 18% is, are from the ASBP and, and obviously on the other side from industry. Um, not that it's a competition, it's about merging those data sets and making sure they're, they're doing things and it's about filling the gaps in regards to the reference population that I'll talk about. So if you go across the way, you can see there where our different levels are. For example, if you go across to, for example, um, go across to yearling weight, you can see the black there, there's about 30,000 30, animals in the genetic evaluation. They've got a genotype and a yearling weight phenotype. And you can see the, the, the proportion of uh, industry to, um, to ASBP. Now obviously for our easy to measure traits, our standard measure traits, you expect that to be um, loaded towards the industry herds. It's when we start looking at our more uh, hard to measure traits like our carcass data, our feed intake, et cetera, is where we um, are getting some benefit out of the ASBP to fill the gaps. Um, this is just a cut down look at the scale again um, of some of the hard to measure traits. So starting from um, uh, the, the side closest to the, the axis, you've got days to calving, um, carcass weight, carcass eye muscle area, carcass rump, carcass rib, carcass retail beef yield, carcass intramuscular fat and net feed intake. So, Primarily all the data going to your reference population for those direct commercially important traits are coming from the SI benchmarking program. And again, it's about filling that gap that we not necessarily, might necessarily get from industry in a large scale. Um, as long as they're commercially important, I guess you would say. Um, so that's important to, to see. Um, and, and that gives us some idea of the numbers now. So if you look at something like um, carcass weight, we've got about 3,000 animals in the reference population, similar to the other carcass traits. Uh, they just the numbers of what I graphed, so I won't go into those in lots of detail, but um, I can provide those to anyone who's interested. And this is just looking at it on a percentage basis. So again, you've got all those traits listed across there, and you can see the black's the industry and the red is the ASBP, and that's on a percentage basis going into the reference population. Um, but that's just what goes in the breed plan. Um, in the ASBP, we record lots of other stuff. Um, we record immune competence, and Brad Hines going to talk after this about where we're up to in that space. We've got lots of immune competence phenotypes, 4,000. We've also got MSA grade traits. We've got shear force, fatty acid profiles on a small number of animals, carcass camera grading for intramuscular fat, finest and marbling, all those sorts of things. Um, we've got a small group for methane emissions. We've got uh, some work being done in the heat tolerance area where we're merging data, growth safe and, and climate data, which we're still working on, but uh, we expect to see something there soon. We've got flight time, coat score, structural scores, muscle score. So um, it was interesting, um, the talk over there this morning from Dorian about, um, you know, focusing on the production traits. And we definitely have been doing that as an industry. I don't, don't deny that. But um, I think you'll, you know, there's some traits in there that don't fit in that production category, such as a new competence. So I think it's important we, we use this reference population to record those, those other traits as well where we can. Okay, so why is that all important? Why is the reference population important, particularly the numbers of them? Um, this is really here, and this is what, what this is doing is graphing uh, the accuracy of a breeding value you'd get for a genotyped only animal based on the size of a reference population. This is using some, some Angus specific assumptions, so I won't go into those, but um, and lo looking at different heritability levels. So heritability of trait like 0.1 would be like our days to calving. Heritability of say 0.4 would be close to our carcass IMF currently used in breed plan, okay? So, so you can see what size reference population we would need to get certain accuracy levels for certain trait heritability levels, all right? So where we're sitting at the moment is for most of our hard to measure traits, like I showed you, days to calving, carcass, direct carcass data, we're currently sitting about here, somewhere between two to 3,000 records, okay? And those traits vary a lot. Like obviously, uh, as I said, days to calving is a bit below 0.1. So with that sort of level of say 2,000 records, we're gonna get about 30% accuracy in our breeding bees out of a genotyped only animals. That's still something, that's, that's nothing to be laughed about, that's for sure, but we need, if we want higher accuracies, we need more animals in a reference population. Um, and you can do the same sort of calculations for our carcass alignment for those things which are higher heritability, so you need slightly less depending on what you're aiming for. Um, 
but that's why it's important. You know, we've, we're, I guess we've really uh, got at the tip of the iceberg for some of those hard to measure traits. We're doing well, but we need more data and we've got to keep these things rolling along. Okay, so that's the reference population. How am I going, Andrew? Pretty good. Five minutes. Um, the other thing, so that, that's a key thing I wanted to talk to you is about the validation, about the uh, reference population, because that's really the, the crux of it, and things are, are moving along nicely there, but there's more work to do. The other thing is about the validation of Angus breed plan. That was sort of that objective too, about validating breed plan. Um, and we've looked at this. So what we've done is we've basically um, done a bit of a process where within each of the cohorts, we've ranked uh, the size on their breeding values for certain traits. And we've looked at the top 10 versus the bottom 10, for, for example, for birth weight EBV, but we've done it for lots of traits. Um, we then calculate what the expected difference should be in progeny based on the differences in their EBVs of those sire groups. Okay, so what we expect is the difference we see in those sire groups, their average EBVs, we expect half the difference to be passed on and therefore displayed in the progeny. So it's easy to do that first part. The second part, we've actually measured that through the sire benchmarking. Okay, so primarily we've cal well, what we've done is we've calculated those EBV differences based on the sire differences when they've come into the program. So this is before all the ASPP data went in, so it was when they came into the program as young, relatively low accuracy bulls in a lot of cases, some high accuracy, but mostly low accuracy. Um, and we've looked at the differences and see what are the expected outcomes, or are the, are the outcomes as expected based on what we saw in the progeny of the sire benchmarking program when we measured them um, for a range of traits related to those EBVs. Um, I'll take you through a little bit of this and then summarise it. So I've just picked out a few traits, but this is just looking at cohorts one to three at the moment. We've also repeated it for cohorts five and six, which I'll show you as well. But this is just looking at our one to three um, situation. Um, this has been out for some time. Hopefully you've all seen it, but I'll give it to you again. Um, so when we looked at cohorts one to three, we looked at the highest 10 bulls for birth weight EBV and the lowest 10 bulls. The EBV difference, the highest 10 had an average of 6.2 kilograms, the, the lowest um, 10 had an average of 2.8. So what difference in birth weight should we see in the progeny? Do some calculations in your head. Does anyone want to yell any numbers out? What's that, Bob? 1.7, Bob's all over it. That's why we employed him. Um, so 1.7 kilograms we would expect in the progeny. So half the difference we'd see in the EBVs, okay? So what we did then is we generated progeny out of the ASBP, uh, measured those progeny for birth weight through our crop rate of herds. And what we saw, the difference was two kilograms difference. So the highest, um, highest birth weight EBV bulls, bulls were two kilograms heavier on average than the low birth weights, 38.4 versus 36.4. Okay, so not exact, but pretty good. Pretty happy with that. But that's one of our traits we measure all the time, right? There's lots of birth weight data coming in, even though some people question some birth weight data. Um, it's doing a pretty good job in regards to predicting progeny performance as watch EBV do. Um, so I thought I'd look at another trait, eye muscle area, which is basically a trait where we've got lots of indirect measurements through ultrasound, but not a lot of direct carcass data. Let's have a look at that. So again, the highest 10 versus the lowest 10. The high group had 7.8 on average. The low group had 2.2. So what's the difference? What should we see in the progeny? Any calculations? 2.8, so there's 5.6 difference, and there should be 2.8 square centimetres in the carcass, all right? Um, and this is in a standard 400 kilogram steer carcass we're talking about now, so that's, a, that's sort of the end point we're looking at. Through the side benchmark, and we generated the steer progeny, killed them, measured the differences, and it was pretty much bang on this one, which is nice. Um, so the, the high group had 85.6 square centimetres average, the low group 82.8, so I'm pretty happy with that, that's pretty good. Um, in regards to the carcass IMF, we did the same thing, 2.8 versus 8, it's a 2% difference. Yep. 2% difference in EBV, we expect 1% difference in carcass IMF. We actually measured carcass IMF, um, so we took a meat sample out of the, out of the, the animals in the chiller, we got the uh, carcass IMF estimated through a meat science lab at University of New England. And we saw a 1.2% difference, again, in the right direction. So again, it's showing that the EBVs, particularly when you're looking at an averaging level on size and young bulls, uh, is working very well. And we should have very, very strong confidence in, in what we're doing. Um, we've got that all summarised, though. So these are the summary results for cohorts one to three. 
um, which we've just been through across all the traits, birth through to net feed intake. Um, and it showed that, yes, the EBVs are working in that context. And we've just repeated that for cohorts four to six. We had to remove cohorts four because it was such a small cohort of size. There's only 20 in there. There wasn't much variation in EBV. So we did remove that. But in, when we looked at cohorts five and six, which had a good range of size, uh, basically followed the same thing. There's a couple of, there's a rump fat issue there that I've got to look at in more detail. We only, list, li um, we only um, finished this analysis last week. So... I'm not showing the right response there we would like, but in regards to all the other traits, they're lining up very, very well, which is nice. Um, so again, we should have pretty good confidence, a very high confidence in our breeding values um, based on this analysis. Okay, time for a quick plug before I finish up. Um, we're currently taking nominations for cohort 10. We've currently got 20 odd size nominated, which is great. Uh, we're looking again to put another 40 odd bulls into this year, if not more. So we have to catch up a bit from the smaller joining last year. Um, so if anyone's interested, come and see me at the conference um, or send me an email or you can do a survey online and, and get that to me. Um, the other thing we're looking for at the moment is more cooperative cow herds. Um, Northern New South Wales is a bit interesting at the moment to join, I'd say, coming this coming spring. But um, if there's anyone interested in, a, in a Southern New South Wales and in Victoria, um, come and see me as well. Or Nick Butcher, who you'll see around, uh, we're going to see more, more cows. Um, saying that, we've already got responses from about uh, a dozen herds that have got pretty big cow herds that are interested to in get involved. So, uh, but interested here from anyone else. So, just to finish off, um, what I what I think we've learned from the side benchmarking is um, the side benchmarking program, along with Angus breeders, uh, building a very effective reference population, um, particularly for hard to measure traits and commercially relevant traits. This will really underpin our genetic evaluation into the future, our current and future, um, and particularly the development of genomic technologies. Brief plan EVVs are working, so that's great. Um, and for the future, we need to continue to build this reference population. We can't just stop, that's for sure. We've got to keep investing in it, and, and Angus Australia is committed to that. Um, and you'll also see new research breeding values coming on stream and genomic technology attached to those, and that's a nice segue into the next presentation of Brad Hines. So I'll finish up there, Andrew. Thank you.